Anyway, it's a pleasure to welcome Fudo McPherson from the University of Leeds, who's going to talk to us about pseudo finite groups. Thank you. Many thanks to the organisers for putting this together. Um, so, the goal is to give a kind of introduction to pseudo finite groups, which I would think of as the the, the, the logic of finite groups, or, or the, the model theory of the uniform behaviour of finite groups. So, uniform behaviour in, in classes of finite groups from the viewpoint of logic. I think from my point of view, which is around model theoretic stability theory, so I'll be saying a little bit about stability theory. Um, there are lots of topics I won't touch on. Um, there's a survey I wrote that appeared last year or this year um, in archive for mathematical logic. Um, it's titled something like um, Model Theory of Finite and Pseudo-Finite Groups, or a Survey of Finite and Pseudo-Finite Groups. Um, so most of what I'm saying is there in, in some form. So the rough plan um, today will just be, I don't, I don't want to assume people are used to working with first order logic or model theory, so maybe a bit pedantic, but I'll give some sort of informal introduction to, to model theory. So apologies, that, that's very familiar. Um, and just some observations on what pseudo-finance means. So observations on pseudo-finance groups. And then second and third, I'll see how it goes. But roughly speaking, the second one, I'll, I'll talk about some theorems of John Wilson on simple pseudo-finite groups. And on solubility. So characterizing solubility in finite groups, definability of soluble radicals. And I'll say I'll start to say something about stability theory in the model theory sense. Stability theory and generalization. And then the third part, I'll say something about um, stability and, and related concepts in pseudophonic groups. And uh, sort of what this sort of says about finite simple groups. So connections to finite simple groups. And also something on um, pseudophonic permutation groups. I'm not sure how far I'll get on from this. Okay, we're up now. So, to begin with sort of the sort of basics of first order logic, I haven't really talked about so far. Yeah, so um, fix a first order language. First order language. And um, just for now, I'll have a very general form. I'll just write this in the form called L. And it'll, it'll come with a bunch of relation symbols, function symbols, and constant symbols. So we'll just have a family. For now, I'll just a family of relation symbols indexed by some index of I. A family of function symbols indexed by J. And a family of constant symbols indexed by J. And at this stage, all that we want to say is that each relation symbol and each function symbol has some prescribed arity, so some prescribed number of arguments for variables. So we'll say um, ri, arity, ai, and fj, arity, bj. Just for just an extension. So that's very general. Usually, some things I was talking about i, j, and k, these index sets of the finite. Possibly k could be input. Sometimes you just want to name infinitely many elements of a structure all at once. The k might be input, but i and j for this, for these vectors, will be finite. And typically, I'll work, you know, you decide at the start of the day what you're going to do. You're going to work in monetary groups or rings or graphs or something. You typically sort of decide on the language you want. So I'll, use, I'll be mostly working with the language of groups, which for me would just have 
um, well, no relation symbols, but two function symbols. So we'll have a binary function symbol, a unary function symbol, and a constant. If you happen to wake up one morning and want to work with ordered groups, you probably have an extra relation symbol back too for the order. Okay, so um, you, you, you also have the, the basic data which is always around in class of logic. So you also have connectives, so propositional connectives, and or not by the and you have quantifiers. So for all that exists. And just to make, to make sense, you're going to have things like brackets. And you have, we'll have a symbol for equality. And then we'll have variables. So say xi, xy. That's just the basic stuff that's available for personal logic. I have a question. Sure. So I'm a little bit confused how this language is a language. Right. Because you just said we have these symbols. So you're saying you're taking, or what, what do you do? <coughs> OK, so th this thing <coughs> is just a bunch of symbols. And the next thing you do is you start to form formulas and sentences in some sensible way. And those are the elements of the language? Well, those will be the formulas. Okay. So the formulas or sentences will be, will be built out of these symbols. Okay. So we, we form formulas in a natural way. So um, I'm taking this fairly lightly. Uh, so, for example, let's suppose we're going to be working in language of groups. You might write down a formula to form for all y, x times y equals y times x. That's it. You can read that as, na as a natural thing to say. It's, it's trying to say um, that x keeps every, x is the center. Okay. And this, so there's no, this is a notion of a formula. So putting together symbols in this in a sensible way, there's then a notion, a very natural notion, of a free variable and a bound variable. So in this formula, the x's are free. They're not within the scope of any quantifier. This y really is, quant is quantified, and the y's here are within the scope of this. So x is a free variable. And to indicate, I might refer to this formula as the formula phi of x. So here I would list any variables that occur free would occur in this list. So I'll run this form 5x to indicate that x is or might be a free variable. Um, OK, and then there's a notion that that's a formula, and then a sentence is just a, a formula with no free variables. So, for example, if I've written down for all x, for all y, x times y times y times y, that would be a sentence. Yeah, sure. Question. I would write for all y in my group. So you don't have a set underlying. Right. I haven't yet mentioned a group. Um, yeah. Yes. I mean, what, when we start to have a group around, the implicate, when you write down a formula and you, or a sentence and you ask whether it's true in the group, Okay, it's yeah. assumed that the variables range through elements of the group. Okay. That's what yeah. goes in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So I haven't yet said what it means to be true or false in a structure, but a sentence like this, in a particular structure, ought to be true or false. True in some, false in some. So this will, this will be true in a meaning group, false in a non group. Okay. So, so far I've just talked about syntax, just talked about formula sentences, language. There's a parallel part of the story in the semantics where you talk about structures and what the symbols mean in a structure. So we've, we've got our language up there. I want to talk about structures for that language. 
So it's, here, it's an L structure. M. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to abuse notation left, right, and centre here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use the same symbol for the structure of the Ritz universe, just to avoid having too many points. So the structure will be M, but its universe will also be M. Okay. So the universe will domain of the structure. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to have a bunch of relations corresponding to the relation symbols. And just for one moment, I'm going to distinguish the, the relations from the symbols. I'll, I'll write an M there. So the, the, the interpretation in M of the relation R I. And function functions. And constants. So that would be a structure. <coughs> so here, Ri, the interpretation of Ri in M, I'd call that the interpretation of Ri in M. This will just be, well, we said that Ri had arity Ai, so this will just be a subset of M to the Ai. Mm -hmm. And by, by Fj to the M, will just be a function from m to the bj, because that's the arity, to m. And ck to the m will just be some chosen element of m. So as I said, just for one moment, I sort of put in these superscripts m, just to indicate that you're doing something and going from the symbol of the language to the meaning of the structure. Mm -hmm. I'm now going to drop that, <laughs> just to avoid clutter. So I'll now, um, now drop the superscript. So I'll just write Ri inside of the area. OK, so we have a language, and we have a structure corresponding. Of course, there could be many different structures corresponding to the same language. Very different groups, for example. Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm sort of avoiding any kind of set theory that gives you the proper classes in this. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is uh, M a Ri just like a product? Sorry? So the product? Like AI times uh, Yeah, M to the AI just means the Cartesian product. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. AI is good rules for that. Right, so we have the language and the structure. So the symbols and the language have a meaning in the structure. We haven't yet addressed any notion of truth or falsity, what it means for, say, a sentence to be true in the structure. And I'm not going to sort of go into the details. There's a formal sort of, um, definition of truth of a formula in a structure, uh, which is based, it's inductive, it's based on the length of the formula, on the complexity of the formula. I won't go into that, but I think. I think a sort of common sense interpretation tells you how it ought to work. The main, the main thing to emphasize is that when you say that, say, a sentence is true in a structure, any variables range over elements in the structure. You know, they, we do the first order logic, the so variables range over elements rather than, say, a subset of the structure. Um, so there's a natural notion. Of 
two of a formula a sentence in a structure. So, for, what have we been trying to define? Say you've got a given, given a formula, say, psi x1 up to xn, and you've got elements in a structure m, and you've got elements a1 to an in m, then the concept that you define is um, m, yeah, this symbol, which either satisfies psi of a1 to an. So um, this is just satisfying. So psi of a1 to an is true in m. Um, so I won't define that, but just um, it's a natural thing so long as you remember the quantifier's range of elements in the structure. That sort of works. So just for example, um, going back to our earlier example, if phi of x is um, for all y x times y equals y times x in our language of groups, and g is a group, and a is in g, then g satisfies phi of a just means that a is in the center of the group. So to really be comfortable with that as a reasonable notion, there's then the concept of a, a definable set in a structure, which is really at the heart of one theory, I'd say. So there's the notion of a definable set. So this is just the solution set of a formula in a structure. So a definable set. Solution set of formula in a structure. And a lot of model theory is about trying to understand the combinatorics and the geometry of definable sets. Um, one thing I would want to say here is that when we talk about definable sets, it's partly a matter of convention, but typically we allow formulas to have parameters, which you can think of as adding new constant symbols to the language. So you might, for example, take a formula, working again with language groups, you might take the formula psi x y, which just says um, x times y equals y times x, and take group g, and take the elements a in, in g. Then the centralizer of a will just be the set of all x such that x times a equals a times x. Or if you like, um, the set of all x such, uh, such that g satisfies psi xx. So formally you can think of this as adding a new constant symbol to the language and interpreting it by the end of the day. So I'll free allow myself to do that. Um, when I talk about definable sets, I'm allowed to name elements of my structure. So I think a sort of standard point of view would be to think of definable sets as something like generalization of algebraic variety or constructible sets. In fact, if your structure is a complex field, you work in a language for rings, then by a theorem of Chevalier, every formula is equivalent to a formula with no quantifiers. So you can think of every formula as a Boolean combination of polynomial formulas. These may have some parameters, may have some parameters around, putting values for parameters that become coefficients. And what you're finding is every, the solution set of a formula will just be a Boolean combination of solution sets of polynomials. So it must be a constructible set. So in that sense, definable sets are sort of like constructible sets. Okay. 
So I'll say a little bit about um, sentences and the theory of structure and elementary equivalents. As I said earlier, a sentence is just a, a formula with no free variables. So, if sigma is a sentence, if sigma is an L sentence, and N is a particular L structure, then sigma is going to be true in N or false in N. So, I mean, if, if sigma was a formula, then this wouldn't be clear. If, if, if sigma just said x is in the center, that would be true of some elements, false of other elements. Mm -hmm. But, if, you, but if, it's, if it's a sentence, it would say something like everything is in the center. That would be true of the groups of billion, false otherwise. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> so we, we take together all the sentences through a structure. And that's called the theory of the structure. Right, I don't really want to delve too much. I mean, what's, it, it'll be part of the inductive definition of triple falsity. What's really going to happen is that for any formula with, say, three variables x1 to xn and particular elements a1 to an, the formula is true or false of a1 to an in the structure. And you prove that inductively on the complexity of the formula. So the starting point would be a formula which is, say, just a relation symbol. We, a starting point would just be, say, say a relation, say, x less than y. So a, rela a, re yeah, a relation is just a subset of a structure, and it'll be, um, the formula will be true of a pair, say, precisely if that pair is in the relation, otherwise it's false. But why is induction going to work? Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe I can put that back to the evening. I don't think I can give a quick, snappy answer to that. Um, I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, you, you must have to work a little bit to do the induction. It's not an immediate thing. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> And maybe sort of think about it in a, a concrete case where you, I mean, the, the issue is really going to be with quantifiers. Yeah. And think about it when you first introduce a quantifier, say. So. Okay, so we have the notion of a um, sentence being true in a structure or false in a structure. So the theory of a structure M, M so that's just the theory of M is just going to be the set of all sentences sigma such that M satisfies sigma. Remember, this means sigma is true then. And then we would say that, well, that, this gives you a natural equivalence relation on structures. You would say that M is elementarily equivalent to M, to, and so M elementarily equivalent to M if the theories are the same.
So the theory of M is kind of partial characterization of M. It's what you can say about M just by sentences in logic. Okay. So there's a, there's a natural notion of isomorphism in this world. So you've got this language, the obvious notion of isomorphism of structure is just a bijection which respects relations, functions, constants. But you always refer to a language. So yeah, yeah. that's right. If you say two things are isomorphic, they have to be in the same language. Right? Um, so there's a notion of isomorphism of structure. So if a language is groups, this will just be group isomorphism. Um, this gives you an equivalent relation on, a, on the L structures which will be coarser than isomorphism. So it's an equivalence relation. Coarser than isomorphism. So typically, if you're, if you're, um, say, say M is infinite, the language is countable, then there will be n elementary equivalent to m of all infinite cardinals. These are the Lernhaus Cullen theorems. So you get models of different cardinals. So they couldn't be isomorphic, but they are elementary equivalent. So I mean, this is part of the power of model theory that you can um, you can move between structures, satisfy the sentences. You can you can uh, you want to prove something on one structure. Maybe it's a first order statement. You prove it in a different structure, which is elementary equivalent. So, one point so, so, so that really means that every formula that n satisfies, n satisfies, and every formula that n satisfies, n satisfies. Yeah, maybe it's exactly. Yeah, yeah. Compare that, those sets, or those, actually, you know, I don't even know there's sets, right? It's this collection of sentences. How do you compare? So, that. I mean, um, there's a, maybe, maybe there's a, as a way just to make it a bit more concrete. Um, let's look in the language of rings, and you could take basic axioms which express the time of field, and I have characteristic zero, mm -hmm. and then for every n, I could have an axiom which says every polynomial of degree at most n has a root. So those will be the axioms of algebraic closed fields of characteristic zero. And they determine, the, say, the theory of the complex numbers. So, uh, I mean, there will, be, there will be other sentences true of the complex numbers, but they'll follow from those axioms, essentially. They'll be true in any, in any field of those axioms. Um, so, the theory will, will essentially be that the logical content of those axioms, and there'll be different models. So, for example, the algebraic closure of the rationals will also be a model of the same theory. Formally, the theory will be the collection of all sentences true of the complex numbers. I don't know, does that get anywhere near answering? <laughs> yeah, I think the problem is how to prove this. I mean, okay. you show that all, that doesn't all work. the sentences yeah, yeah. Yeah. Over the complex numbers are the same as over the the yeah, yeah. Rest, uh, I mean the, the algebraic uh, integer. There, there does some work. I mean, for there maybe <laughs> an easier example to think about might be um, to show that, say, the rationals as an ordered set satisfies the same sentences as the reals as an ordered set. Okay. So, but take an element in the algebraic closure of Q then it satisfies the polynomial equation. Right. <laughs> elements of C, there are elements of C that don't. So you cannot... But, but you, can't, you can't with a single sentence yeah. say, say that, that's the point. Satisfy yeah. the yeah. polynomial equation. Yeah. 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 Maybe that's the point. Okay. Yeah. 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 Just going back to what I was saying there, um, it would be a easy argument, it's a potentially Kansas argument, that any two countable dense total orders for that endpoints are isomorphic. And that tells you that the axioms which just say, I'm a total order, I've no biggest element, no smallest elements, I'm dense, determine a complete theory. Every sentence follows either from those or negation does. And that's enough to tell you that the rationals as a total order 
has the same theory as the real decision. So there, there the, the, the key tool is, is, is Cantor's theory. So that can work on your hands. Uh, so you need some sort of isomorphism, as I said. Yeah, yeah, there's some work to do there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we have this, this notion of elementary equivalence. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's a bit of I want to say, so if sigma is a set of sentences I'll just say M satisfies sigma. I'll just read that as um, so M satisfies sigma. Or if you like, M is a model of sigma. That will just me uh, means just that uh, M satisfies each set of the sigma. So just a convenient definition. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and then we, we get to really the, 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 the theorem which makes first logic tick, really, which is the compactness theorem. This gets used everywhere. Which says if sigma is a set of sentences, then sigma has a model. So um, sigma is satisfied by some structure if and only if every finite subset. Of sigma. So of course the forward direction is, is triviality. The content is a backwards direction. So you've got a bunch of sentences, very finite subset, it has a model. You've somehow got to build a, a single model which is like all at the same time. There's some work to do. But the, the sentences now are not in your universe in. They're in the language. They're in the language, that's right. That's right, yes. yes. Okay, so I'll now sort of start to um, turn to what we can say about groups. Complicated, you have to, N is also complicated because you have to give meaning in M for all the symbols of the language. Um, but maybe, maybe what you meant is the sentence is complicated. But N sits down below L, the language, right? Um, so no, if the language has, say, infinitely many function symbols, then there'll be infinitely many functions in M. They could all be the same function, but <coughs> they'll have meaning. Sigma has a model. Uh, uh, yeah, that's right. There's always implicitly a given language L, and everything is for L. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so, well, now I guess for the rest of the day, well, this, this talk, I'll, I'll talk about the language of groups. So now L will just be the language of groups. So I'll also think about what sort of things can we express in this language about a group. So what can we express in L groups about a group? So, maybe by a single sentence, or perhaps by a collection of sentences. So, for example, we can certainly express that G is a beam. We just say, as we've done, full X, full Y, X times Y equals Y times X. You could express, say, that G has exponent D. Um, I mean, you can say for all x, x to the d equals 1, and maybe you want to say, and the experiment isn't smaller. <laughs> but, okay, so you can do that. Um, you could express, say, that g is nilpotent of class d, because that's going to be basically given by uh, a word. You've got, you've got, you've got some, some expression in terms of the that's equals one. You, can, you quantify out. You can say that. Or say soluble of the rise length theory. Um, you could express, if you want to say, what, say, say the divisible, whether you want to think of G as a million group, a million group, it doesn't matter. But let's, let's say G is divisible. So for every n, every element has an nth root. You can't express that by a single sentence, but you can by a, an infinite set of sentences. So, uh, express G is divisible. Um, by an infinite set of sentences. So, for each n, we're going to want Okay. For each n, we're going to want something of the form uh, for all x, there exists y, um, y times y times y equals x. n times. Okay, so we can do that. But we, we're needing this infinite set. So what we're saying is that g satisfies this infinite set sigma if and only if g is divisible. Some things you can't express. Um, things like um, G is finitely generated. Or say, maybe, you, maybe you'd have extra constant symbols for certain elements. Uh, you might, uh, G is generated by A1 to AD. Suppose you have extra constant symbols interpreted by these elements. You can't say that G is generated by A1 to AB because you could have elements of the group which were arbitrary long words. Arbitrary long words in this. So there's, no, there's no single sentence which says that every element of the group is a word in these. And in fact, no infinite sentence which says that. Can we go back to finitely generated? Right. What's wrong with finitely generated? Why can't you say that every element is a word? You don't have to care about the length of the word. Why can't you say that every element is a word? In, in well, how would you say things? is a word? Because to say is a word, you've really got to write out the word I in see, the see. formula. And then you end up with a kind of infinite disjunction. But formulas have finite length. Maybe I shouldn't actually say that. Formulas always have finite length. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So you can say something like there exists an n such that a word of length n equals x. That's right. That's right. That's the thing you can say. So, so that's why questions about the definability in groups typically correspond to uniform bounds in groups. So for example, the derived subgroup of a group would be definable if you know that there's a bound, every element is a for some d, every element is the product of both d commutators. I see. So cor definability corresponds to the existence of bounds. Okay. Yeah. Um, is the language you're using, like, does it have a lot of complexity in the transcript hierarchy? Like, is it like a regular language? Oh. Or is it, does it have nothing to do with it? 
I don't think there's anything to do with that. But at least from the point of view of this, it's cool. So, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What, what's wrong with the sentence like for every x there is a sequence of integers? Am I going to do that? Such that x equals and then just write out. Well, the, th the thing is that your sequence of integers is not ranging through the structure. Uh, your structure is the group G. Now, you could imagine okay. a much richer structure, which had, say, two parts, oh, where you had G here okay. and the integers there. But that would be a different game. <laughs> G is bounded to generate generated expressible, yeah? Just G is bounded to be generated, it's expressible, yeah? What do you mean by that? Bounded to be generated, so it's a product of, uh, of cyclic subgroups. So every element is a, can be written as g1 to the n1, g2 to the n2, and so on, really? g1 up to g2. Even there, yeah, you've got problems with the n1, g1 to the n1, because you don't know what n1 is. Um, okay. Unless you bound the n's in advance. No, that won't be a Because yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you end up sort of quantifying over the integers, which you don't have to do. Okay. There is a question here. Yeah, I, Sorry. I wanted to ask about the exactly about this bounded group generator. Right. It's a clever trick that lets you I mean, get around this method. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like you have to quantify over. That's that, that's really the problem. You end up quantifying over the integer, which is not allowed to do. The way I think it's actually right. So likewise you 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 cannot express G is soluble. Um, because you, um, you can express solubility given derived length, but not just solubility. And the problem essentially here is that <coughs> supposing there was, say, for example, a single sentence, which was equivalent to G is soluble. Well, we know that there is a sentence which says G is soluble of the derived length at most D. Mm -hmm. And we know that there are soluble groups of arbitrary large derived length. So what you're going to do is you're going to write down a collection of sentences which will include this signal which says I'm soluble and which will include sentences saying I'm not soluble at driving for most D. So, so for, every, for every D you have a sentence saying I'm not soluble at driving for most D. Put all those together, that collection of sentences, every finite subset has a model. You just choose a soluble group of large enough to drive length. So every finite subset has a model. Then we appeal to this compactness theorem, the whole lot does together. Mm -hmm. What is that? It's a soluble group, which is not of any given derived length. That's the problem. <laughs> you don't see how you use compactness. Okay. Likewise, you can't express G as milk potent, um, or say G is periodic. Like okay. All right, so I think what I'll do, the other thing I want to do is say a little bit about ultra products. They don't, they don't play a central role in this, but I think, it, I think if you want to have sort of some sort of confidence that pseudo finite groups are bound, it's useful to be able to think in terms of ultra products. We, we mentioned them in the, in the, in the, in the, in the discussion session last night. I want to say a little bit about formalism ultra products. <coughs> but, um, well, sorry, what I'll do is I'll first of all want to say about pseudo finiteness and then about ultra products. So G is, G is finite is also not possible. That's, yes, that's right, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you could express G is infinite by collection sentences. You could say you could say it doesn't have size one and because for every n, you have a sentence saying it doesn't have size in most n, because you've got equality in the language. Mm -hmm. And then that collection of sentences together expresses G is infinite. Okay.
Okay, so also, also really, I guess this will be section two. So it's pseudo-finiteness. <coughs> and not for us. So, <coughs> so the definition I'll give of pseudo-finiteness. Um, in model theory, typically, most of the time, is about infinite structures. And the issue is that you can, if you did work in the basic first order logic setting, you can specify a finite structure completely. You just, you, you just say there are x1 to xn, every element is one of these, these are distinct, and then you write down everything through it, through those elements. And that means logic, you know, if you're just working in full first order logic with no restrictions, Logic can't do anything useful for a particular finite structure. But it can do something useful for infinite structures, or for, say, for infinite families of finite structures. Um, <coughs> so definition. So a structure M is pseudo finite. The way I'll define it is if it is infinite, And every sentence true, every sigma in theory of M, has a finite form. And so every, every particular statement true of it is true in some finite structure. And you can just sort of trace around the negations. And so, so a pseudo-finite group will be an infinite group with this property. So every sentence is true of a finite group. Because you can build into the sentence that I'm a group, the axioms of groups. Um, and so what this really means is that um, a pseudo-finite group is an infinite group satisfying Every sentence in the common theory of finite groups. You can take that as a definition. So, so if a group satisfies every sentence, which is true of all finite groups. Every sentence and only that. Sorry? In only those sentences. Uh, no, the others as well. But it, in particular, it satisfies every sentence true of all finite groups. But th that collection of sentences won't be a complete theory. There will be other sentences which neither them or the negation has that property. The theory of M is all the sentences that are satisfied in M, right? The, uh, <coughs> that's right. So this is saying that... But that's a different statement to the next. Yeah. If, if you play around, play around with negations, they're equivalent. <laughs> um, you come out to the same thing. So for, so, for example, so suppose you have a, um, a pseudo-finite group, then every sentence will be true of it, true, true of it, will be true of some finite group. So if sigma is true of all finite groups, if sigma is a sentence true of all finite groups, then not sigma holds in no finite group. So by this first condition, not sigma is not true of G, so sigma is true of G. So that gives you one, one direction of the equivalence between these two statements. They really are the same. Okay, so I want to say something about ultra filter and ultra filter and ultra filter. Um, ultra filter. So this fits an infinite set I. So this thing is a general motion. So ultra filter on I is a, is a family, I call it U, of subsets of I. 
such that, well, what do we want? First of all, we want to take a filter, which means that, well, it doesn't contain the empty set, and it's not empty, so the particular I itself is in U. It's closed under finite intersections, so if, if A and B are in U, then A and set B is in U. It's closed upwards. So if, say, A is in U, and then the A is contained in B, then in I, then B is in U, so that's the square jump. Uh, and then the ultra bit, so this is the, this is, this is just filter axioms. This is where you like take as a maximal filter. So this comes down to saying that if A is any subset of I, then A is U, or I minus A is in U. Okay, that's not a filter. And I mean, existence of these, um, so, well, no. I'll say first of all, there's a kind of trivial example of the filters. If you take an element of I, A and I, and look at all the sets containing A, that would be an algebra filter. It's completely boring. So a principal algebra filter, so if, if A is in I, then the set of all A such that A is in A, is not a filter, is a, is a principle. But these aren't getting any use to us. We're going to be working with non principle articles. And that's where you know, you're getting out of, away from sort of constructivist things. It's less comfortable with the set theory principles involved, which I'm not going into. So, is this something? Is this a finite group? So, well, what, what I'm going to give you using an ultra filter is a construction of a superfinite group. That's a good point. There'll be an ultra product of finite groups. That's the idea. Okay, so we just suppose we have an ultra filter on the natural number. So, so let's say um, U be a non principal ultra filter on the natural number. Okay, and let, let's say pick a family of structures. So, um, so let's, well maybe I'll make things a bit concrete. So I'll, I'll work just with groups. So let um, MI, or I'll say GI, I in M, be a family of groups. Okay, so the, the idea is the ultra filter gives us a notion of largeness. So a large set is a set in the ultra filter. So it gives you a way of saying a property holds almost everywhere. Well, a, a property holds in almost all groups of this family if the set of all I where it holds is in the ultra filter. That's the intuition in this. So we look at the, the Cartesian product of the groups. Um, so we define an equivalence relation given by the ultra filter on the Cartesian product of the groups. So where you're going to say the sequence GI, which is an element of this Cartesian product, 
will be equivalent, so I might, might be able to subscript to you just for now, to the sequence here yeah, prime, if they're equal almost everywhere. If the set of all i such that gi equals gi, GI prime um, is equal to the equal to everywhere. And then the other product. has universe, well, according, according to G star, would just, just be the Cartesian products of the GI modulo the So it's a quotient of the Cartesian product. Um, and let me just define the group operation. So you're going to say that uh, GI, the sequence GI times the sequence HI equals the sequence KI. You have to define that to hold if it holds almost everywhere. So then if the set of all i such that gi hi equals ki in the group gi is in u. So the, the, I'm doing it just a group, so this is a completely general modern heritage construction works in any language. And then there's a, there's a you can have relations as well, it doesn't matter. And then the, the, the theorem that makes things work is this theorem of Walsh, which says that um, if you have an Arch product in this sense, that it, for, any, for any sentence sigma, it'll be true of G star precisely if it's true of almost all of the GIs in the sense of the other building. Um, so for any sentence sigma, G star satisfies sigma if and only if the set of all i and i that's the gi satisfies sigma is in yeah <coughs> is large. So the proof of this involves about carrying things through quantifiers and so on. It'll be true by definition for very simple sentences, but it gets carried through quantifiers. All right, so take an algebra product of a group that will be a group. An algebra, an algebra product, sorry, an algebra product of abelian groups will be the abelian group, for example, things like this. And then you get another characterization of superarguments. is that um, an infinite group if you wanted you could put the word field or ring or anything else um, is pseudo-finite if and only if um, it is Elementarily equivalent that satisfies the same tendencies to some infinite alpha product. Gives you, if you, you know, if you happen to have an ultra filter in your cupboard, that gives you a nice way of producing pseudophonic groups. So just, just to get a little sense of this, you could take, say, an ultra product of groups, say, SL2, um, say, 3 to the n, for example, and then modulate to multiple natural numbers. So that's going to give you some pseudo-finite group over a, over a field of category 3, for example. 
<laughs> so this must be a, a group over a, a pseudo product field. So that gives you the way you make examples, in some ways. Okay, I'll stop there. Here you have written for your index set uh, on the, on, uh, in the Roche theorem yeah. and I, uh, and uh, you, you started with the natural numbers. I'm oh, sorry. In the proposition. Yeah. By infinite you mean counted the infinite? Um, no, I, I, I did actually mean just infinite. Yeah. All right. But it's true that when I well, here. I, I was taking my, my general concept of object products, I was taking an arbitrary process out there. Down here, I was thinking of natural numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Any additional questions? Is it eventually equivalent to natural products? Or do you need bigger index sets? Could you take bigger index sets? Yeah. You could have some very, very large groups. So you, 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 sorry. Yeah. The library is countable, but you could have a pseudo-finite group of, of any of the cardinality. Well, no, you, you said it's elementary equivalent to some infinite hypermodel. And I was asking, is it a countable hypermodel? So, so the answer is not necessarily, because... Countable uh, index set. Can yeah, yeah, yeah. If it was a countable index set, then that would give you a bound on the cardinality of the group. No, that's not a contradiction because it's elementary equivalent to. It's fine. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, oh, I'm so, uh, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, I guess that's fine. Yes, I guess. You can take counsel, right? Sure. Thank you. 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 Thank you.